such models are uh, developed and tested uh, appropriately. Uh, so today I'm going to just uh, go into a little bit of uh, background on what prediction models are uh, and how to, um, what issues to consider before, during and after uh, developing a, a prediction model. Um, sometimes prediction, prediction models uh, that's because they're used to calculate the risk of an outcome happening to a patient. Um, so I'm going to begin today's talk by describing what we mean by risk and then extending that to uh, prediction models. Um, so what is uh, prognosis? Um, well, it's just another way of saying what, what is the risk or probability of uh, some outcome happening to a particular patient in the future? Um, but how do we define what risk actually is? The um, best way to do that is to uh, go through an example. So in 2005, Hansen published a systematic review uh, which concluded that uh, IVF um, is associated with a 40% increased risk of uh, major congenital anomalies uh, compared with uh, natural conception. Um, so this 40% sounds quite high, I'm sure you'd all agree, but what does this actually mean? Well, another way of interpreting this 40% uh, increased risk is saying that the risk of a congenital anomaly in an IVF infant relative to the risk in a non-IVF infant is 1.4. So it's another way of saying the relative risk is 1.4. Um, if, if the risk of congenital anom anomaly is 40% higher for IVF, we need to find out what the risk of congenital anomaly is in the non-IVF infants in order to see how serious or large this risk is in the IVF infants. So a nice way of illustrating this is to use a plot called Kate's plot, which is basically a nice square here of 100 green smiley faces. Um, from the literature, we know that the risk of a congenital anomaly in naturally conceived infants is around three to 5%. So I'm gonna be conservative here and take the larger of those of that range. Um, and that's represented here by those five red sad faces uh, in, the, in the Kate's plot. And we call this 5% the absolute risk, the actual risk of congenital anomaly in the group of, of infants uh, conceived naturally. So now if, if we know that the relative risk is 1.4, then the absolute risk of congenital anomaly in non-IVF infants must be the five out of 100 that we know, plus 40% of that five out of 100, which is uh, just seven out of 100. Because it's what we're basically saying is that even though the relative risk sounds a scary number, a 40% increased risk, um, but it's only 40% increase of an already small number. So while the relative risk is useful to show how much more risk one group has over another, the absolute risk is more useful as it tells us what the actual risk is in each group. So we can see here in the plot, uh, we've crossed out two more faces to show that uh, IVF is, is, has a worse outcome and there's, it would affect seven infants. So this example concerns the average uh, relative and absolute risks over all babies. But in prediction modeling, we are interested in the absolute risk that I've just described um, of an event, but not in the overall uh, group of patients, but we are interested in individual patients. Um, we are all unique, different ages, different comorbidities, different sizes, different biology and all the variation in our personal characteristics will result in different individual risks for whatever outcome we're studying. So how do we estimate risk uh, of an outcome by factoring all of these important clinical characteristics? Well, we uh, can use clinical prediction models. Um, these pr clinical prediction models are also known by uh, clinical prediction rules. They're sometimes called prognostic or diag not diagnostic models. Uh, people call them by the actual kind of tool that they sometimes are created, like nomograms and scorecards. 
Um, but they're defined basically as a, they're basically mathematical equations which combine uh, a number of characteristics that could be related to the patient, the disease or the treatment uh, in order to predict the diagnostic or prognostic outcome. By diagnostic, they mean an outcome that's actually in, that's potentially in the patient now as we see them, whereas prognostic is something that may happen in the future. Um, and I've added here this little few, few extra words saying in new patients, because it's really in new patients that we want these models to perform well in not just the, the data that we've used to develop the model. Can I just check that you all can hear me okay so far and see slides and yeah. Everything is fine, David. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so why are prediction models important? Well, in today's era of um, evidence-based medicine, there's a need for an individualized approach to medical decision-making. Um, and clinical prediction models may provide uh, evidence-based uh, input for shared uh, decision-making by summarizing the effects of, of uh, patient characteristics uh, to provide estimates of, of individual risks. Um, they're sometimes used in, both in primary or secondary care uh, in combination with clinical knowledge. No one's saying that they should replace clinical knowledge in order to try and help uh, inform uh, which patients require an intervention or that can be used just to inform the patient of their risk for counselling or, or purposes uh, or to kind of manage their expectations. Um, and they also kind of potentially avoid unnecessary health care. So patients who have low predictions may not have to receive an intervention and so that may save money and save the patient undue stress and harm. Whereas patients with a high probability of having an outcome um, are more likely to receive immediate treatment and therefore potentially have a higher chance of, uh, of recovery. So I'm just going to go through some of the issues we need to consider before uh, developing a prediction model. Um, so the first thing is who, who uh, do you want to make predictions for? Um, so it's important to consider the population that we're interested in. So are you looking at predicting an outcome in women who had breast cancer surgery, women who um, had a breast cancer uh, relapse? Are you interested in predicting from breast cancer diagnosis? Are you interested in, in the reproductive medicine world? Is it from the, you want to predict in patients who have just been diagnosed with some type of infertility? Or are you interested in from the point of uh, beginning IVF treatment? Uh, so that's important to consider. Um, also, what do you want to, to predict? Well, what is the outcome? Um, is, is it uh, mortality or is it recurrence of some disease? Uh, again, is it, you know, is it pregnancy? Is it live birth? Is it miscarriage? Uh, and what is the unit of analysis? Um, I think IVF and reproductive medicine is quite unique in that uh, we can have uh, the unit of analysis could be the individual woman, but it could also be an uh, individual cycle of IVF treatment. Um, we could obviously also be interested in um, you know, multiple children per woman. So that's all important to think about before we start because the actual modeling process that we would use um, depends on that. And when does the outcome um, occur? Is it now, i.e. you would use a diagnostic model? Um, or would it be, is it in the future, are you interested in um, you know, the probability of uh, a woman becoming pregnant in the next year, say, after um, diagnosis of um, infertility? Um, another when is when do you want to make predictions from? Um, so that's another important time point, as well as the outcome we want to know. Uh, you, are you predicting from, say, the first primary care appointment or the first secondary care appointment, time of surgery, time of diagnosis, time of first fertility treatment? Um, that's important because uh, models are developed to be used at a specific time point. And later I will talk about some sometimes models are actually used uh, after that particular time point, which can result in biased predictions or overestimates of predictions. Um, 
which predictors are available at that time point? By predictors, I mean what patient characteristics are available at that time point. Because um, if you don't have the knowledge on, on, on what predictors could be good and what predictors are not, are you ready to make a good prediction model? Um, if, if this is to be used in practice, the clinician using it at the point of contact with the patient must have those predictors available, so must be easily measured and easily at hand. Um, and why do you need this model? Um, does it have a compelling clinical use? Um, it's easy to make just another clinical prediction modeling paper, um, but if it's not going to be used, uh, it's kind of research waste. And if it's not developed properly, it's also research waste and potentially um, can do harm to patients. Um, and also, how are we going to do this work? Uh, will you, how will you get the data? Um, are you going to use retrospective databases? which have advantages and disadvantages on their own. So advantages are you may have a large number of patients, but one disadvantage may be that you are limited in the number of characteristics that you may need for the model. Um, how will you develop the model? Um, will you have a, a good statistician on board with knowledge in the field who can advise? Um, and how are you going to validate the model? And we'll come to that uh, later. So throughout this talk, uh, I'm going to use some examples from a systematic review that uh, a PhD student of, of uh, Bati and I, who um, conducted a review of uh, the quality of clinical prediction models in IVF. So basically, she evaluated the methodological quality uh, um, uh, um, and performance of IVF prediction models to recommend the best quality models to inform uh, couples of their predicted chances of live birth after treatment and to help couples managing expectations. So we described and appraised uh, characteristics of the model uh, development, the inclusion, did they include the important predictors? Um, we looked at the outcomes that they predicted and we assessed each model's kind of performance when they were validated and if they were validated. Um, yeah, so I'll just uh, use examples from that. So this review found 23 studies that developed uh, 35 IVF models, so quite a lot. Um, and also it found 10 other studies that independently externally validated six of those uh, 35 models. So I'm gonna go now cover some things that we need to consider when we um, develop a model. Uh, and the first thing is uh, um, identifying uh, predictors. So we need to um, make sure that we have um, the appropriate uh, clinically important predictors and, or patient characteristics that we need to, in order to um, develop uh, an accurate, precise clinical prediction model. Uh, in our systematic review, we found a total of 50 different predictors across all the models and, and the median per model was around seven predictors um, and one model had up to 14 uh, predictors. Um, so this, this, this is a plot from the paper showing us that uh, female age was the most commonly used predictor which was in 29 of the 35 models. I can't believe six models didn't actually include the female ages, <laughs> the most important predictors, I'm sure you all uh, will know. Um, tubal block was a second most frequent predictor in the model, uh, followed by male factor and endometriosis uh, fertility, infertility. And then uh, we have a couple factor, which is the, how long the couple were trying to conceive for. Um, so those are the most uh, frequent predictors. Another important uh, thing to consider is the unit analysis. Um, in our systematic review, we found that 19 uh, studies just looked at prediction from the first fresh cycle of IVF only. So they ignored uh, subsequent frozen uh, cycles and, and subsequent fresh cycles. Um, six studies looked at individual treatment cycles, so yes, they considered fresh and frozen cycles. 
um, five didn't actually state what the unit of analysis was, uh, and four looked at cumulative live birth. So they looked at all of these cycles, but uh, looked at the, ch the probability of having a baby after um, up to two or up to three cycles of, of, of IVF. Uh, and only three uh, of these 35 models accounted for the clustering effect uh, of women. I guess that's only relevant for the, for the ones that used, um, that didn't use the first cycle. Um, that's important because uh, you can get uh, kind of false, falsely pre too precise predictions if um, you don't account for the, the fact that multiple cycles belong to the same woman. Um, another thing to consider is the outcome. Uh, eight of the models used live birth or, or cumulative live birth as the outcome. Um, nine used ongoing pregnancy. Um, four looked at uh, clinical pregnancy to pregnancy. So there's considerable heterogeneity there and how outcomes were defined as well. <clears throat> Another thing to focus on um, at the modeling stage is uh, not to ignore information. So one warning that we have is do not uh, dichotomize continuous predictors and investigate uh, clinically sensible relationships of the outcome. So what this means is um, things like Continuous predictors or continuous characteristics like female age uh, should be kept as the continuous form of the data, so the actual female age. We shouldn't be chopping up female age into um, less than 35 years of age, greater than 35 years of age. Um, in the review, we found that 16 studies categorize female age, um, and only two of those 16 used the same categories, so all the categories were different. Um, so those two studies used uh, these kind of five year age groups. And when we do that, we're kind of just throwing away useful information. And uh, I've got a nice plot that will kind of illustrate this. Three of the studies assumed a linear relationship. So basically what they meant, they, they assumed that um, with each increasing year of female age, uh, the, the, the probability of having a baby increases with the same amount which we kind of know isn't really true. Um, four studies actually looked at the non-linear relationship, which is more true to real life. This plot kind of hopes, I uh, hope to illustrate that. Um, so it's quite a busy plot, but um, the circles, um, I get, get my little lizard pen out. <laughs> so the circles here, uh, these are what was actually observed um, with regards to uh, the, let me stick it with this. Now. Basically, what we did was we chopped up uh, our data set into little groups and then we plotted the observed probability of having a live birth um, in the observed population. And that's what these circles um, show. So when we fit a model, we want the model to actually kind of predict or be reflective of these little circles um, to be so it has accurate predictions. So the dashed line here is what happens if you just fit female age as a continuous uh, linear outcome. So if we don't do if you just fit the uh, female age um, as it as it looks, we just don't do anything to it. This is basically saying that um, with each increase in female age along the bottom here. Uh, the probability of live birth drops just at a similar amount. It's not quite straight, that's because we've just done a transformation to get the probability of live birth, but um, it doesn't really reflect um, real life. Um, what we do want is uh, this nice black line here is when we fit a non-linear uh, transformation to female age, um, we call this a restricted cubic spline. I'm not gonna go into the detail of that, but um, this is the predictions uh, when we fit this transformation for female age in the model. And you can see it more or less, it fits quite nicely along this, the circles here. And that's what we expect. We expect that uh, up to the age of 32 or 33, uh, the actual probability of having a baby with IVF isn't much uh, different, it's quite similar. And then 33, 34 onwards, it starts to decline quite rapidly. Um, so you can see why if um, you dichotomize female age into two groups, for example, 
you would end up say uh, I'm just going to put two lines here. <laughs> so if you chopped up female age into less than 34, greater than 34, for the under 34s, you may find that the probability of live birth is, uh, say, 35% for everyone under 34. And then from 34 onwards, everyone has a probability of about 10%. So to, it's kind of crazy to think that uh, a 34 year old would have a probability of 35% uh, and then a 35 would just drop straight down to 10%. Um, we need to actually keep the raw data and actually fit uh, a clinically kind of recognized relationship with the outcome. Uh, large. Um, so we should really just do literature search or use expert opinion to find the important characteristics to use in our model before doing any prediction model development. Um, so sample size is your currency. So the more complicated or fancy your modeling strategy, so if you start adding in like complex interactions and lots of variables, the more you have to pay with your sample size. So you should really kind of match your sample size if you know what size your data set will be for analysis. For example, if it's a retrospective data set, you should match your sample size to a sensible modeling, a sensible modeling strategy or vice versa. Um, so avoid data-driven variable selection as well. So you have to pay for that with your sample size as well. So a bit more kind of thoughtful model building and uh, lots of prediction modeling methodologists suggest that rather than using variable selection procedures, we should just put in the model known clinically important factors. Um, from our systematic review, we found that uh, um, data-driven variable selection methods used were, were used in about 70% of studies. Um, so without really thinking much about what kind of variables should go in the model. Um, Three, three studies corrected for overfitting. So there are ways where you can actually adjust for a model if uh, when you validate it, it shows that the predictions are kind of um, too large. Um, you can correct for that. Um, seven studies should have corrected for overfitting, but did not. So they maybe had a small sample and then used too many uh, predictors in their model and then got biased to estimates. Uh, six had very large data sets, so didn't really have to worry too much about overfitting because they had enough uh, currency. Um, the next thing to think about is uh, validation of your model. So once you've developed the model, it's important to test that it actually uh, predicts accurately. Um, so there are two different modeling exercises that you should do. The first one is internal validation. So how well does the model predict in the underlying population that the data originated from? So this basically concerns the reproducibility of, of model performance and the original population that you use to develop your, your model. Um, so some people do this by randomly splitting their data in half and then using half of their data to develop the model and then the other half of the data to validate the model. This isn't recommended uh, because basically you're throwing away half of your data, which could be used to develop a more robust uh, and accurate model. Um, and also, whichever way you randomly split your data in half, you're going to end up with perhaps different imbalances of, of, of characteristics in, in both, uh, both data sets. Um, but there are more kind of novel complex ways to internally validate appropriately, which allows you to develop your model using all the data and validate the model internally using all of your data, um, which I'm not, not going to go into the detail of that now, but I'm happy to chat to anyone afterwards about it. Um, and then once you've internally validated, it's important to externally validate the model. So that's external validation is commonly considered a stronger test. Uh, for prediction models and internal validation because it looks at the transportability of the model rather than the reproducibility. 
So, I mean, how well does your model predict in brand and new patients, basically? And that's essential to support the uh, general application of a prediction model. Uh, and it considers that patients differ in some respect from the patients that you used to develop the model. And if the model predicts well in those patients, that's great. And even if it doesn't, there are things you can do to adjust the model so that it does. Um, in our systematic review, we found uh, 13 studies uh, that conducted uh, internal validations, just over half. Uh, unfortunately, mostly most used random split validation. Uh, four studies externally validated their model in the same article uh, that they developed it in, which is fine. Uh, and then 10 studies in the penalizations, which is good. So you can't have too, um, you can't have too many external validation studies. Um, so I'll just show the numbers uh, by uh, time period, um, so 10 year time period. Um, this orange line basically shows um, that the uh, researchers are doing more internal validation uh, with their model development uh, over time, which is which is great. That's what we want to see. Things are improving in that respect. And this line here shows that um, there are more separate validations as well over time, which is uh, positive. Um, do these validations, how do we actually assess performance? Uh, there are two main uh, approaches for this. The first one is called discrimination. Uh, and that basically assesses how good a model is at correctly distinguishing between patients who have the event uh, and those who do not have the event. So if you imagine uh, having a pair, taking any pair, taking all, sorry, all pairs of patients from your data set that you use to develop the model or that you're using for validation. And one patient in that pair has the event, the other patient doesn't have the event. Does your model assign a higher prediction um, to the one that does have the event than to the one who doesn't have the event? And then um, basically the proportion that's correctly assigned by the model uh, is called the, the discrimination. Um, it's also called the C statistic and it's equivalent to the area under the curve. Uh, and then calibration um, assesses the accuracy of the probabilities from the model across the range of values of predicted risk. So what we do here basically is we plot uh, the um, predicted probabilities from our model against what we actually observed in the data that we used for validation. Um, and if our prediction, predicted probabilities um, agree well, they will lie along uh, the diagonal here. So that's very good calibration in this example. Um, however, if you get something like this, which shows uh, like a systematic over prediction, so all the probabilities are higher than the, the what was observed in the data, um, this can be dangerous if you don't address that, because um, especially if decisions are being made using your model, um, uh, they can be you know, ill-informed and can potentially do harm. Um, what the decision is. Um, just aware of time, we'll probably move on a little quicker. Um, so in our uh, review paper, we found um, if the 14 external validation studies all reported discrimination results, uh, and these ranged from 0.55 to 0.77. Um, so that's not fantastic. Uh, if you imagine discrimination of 0 0.5 is uh, equivalent to it's being, it's no better than tossing a coin uh, and one is perfect discrimination. Um, but discrimination around uh, 0 0.65, 0 0.62 is kind of common in, in reproductive medicine. And I think it's because um, there's a lot of homogeneity in, in uh, the population that we're studying. So they're all uh, women of a certain age and we've perhaps ex we've excluded women who are very fertile, and perhaps women who are very sterile. So we've got like a very homogeneous group of women. So it can be difficult for models to discriminate between the two. But as long as the calibration is actually quite important. So if the calibration is correct, it at least means that the predictions are accurate. 
Um, and the most validated models were uh, Templeton and Nelson and Lawler models, but they didn't validate particularly well. Um, so both of these models were developed using the UK HFEA IVF registry, uh, and they just they predict from each individual cycle of IVF uh, the chances of a live birth. To, um, a brief summary of a model that we developed in Aberdeen, uh, just to show you how it performed. So this model was published to BMJ in 2016, uh, and it predicts the probability of uh, having a baby over multiple complete cycles of IVF from two points in time. So at pre-treatment, there's a model um, which uh, is used before IVF begins, and uh, it's adjusted for predictors of uh, including female age, duration of infertility, uh, whether the female had a and ovulation problems, um, on unexplained infertility, tubal blockage, uh, whether the male factor, uh, the male partner had infertility, previous pregnancy status, and whether the treatment to be was IVF or ICSI. And then the post-treatment model occurred, kind of updated these chances after the first embryo transfer. So um, it had similar predictors to the pre-treatment model, but also had a number of eggs that were retrieved in the first cycle, uh, the number of embryos that were transferred and whether they were transferred on day five or day three. So this model was developed on the UK IVF registry using um, almost 114,000 women. They underwent IVF from 1998 to 2009. Um, it was externally validated uh, using a prospective cohort of 1,500 Dutch women who underwent their first IVF treatment between 2011 and 2014. Uh, in that study, they found that the pre-treatment model required some recalibration, um, which I'll go into in a minute. Uh, but the post-treatment model uh, had a good discrimination, reasonably good for reproductive medicine at point, uh, 0.71, and calibrated well as well. Um, and we've converted our models into an online calculator that can be used uh, by patients or, or clinicians to predict cumulative live birth. So this. This is the calibration plots basically for that pre-treatment model. So the, the first one here uh, is looking just at how well the pre-treatment model performed when it was applied to that Dutch cohort. And um, you can see that there's some um, kind of overestimation here because uh, all of these, the dots and the, the red line is just below the diagonal. So what they did was they recalibrated. Uh, so basically what that basically is, they kind of, uh, use a method that allows us to multiply the predict the uh, coefficients of the model by some small number in order to get um, all the points to lie along the diagonal line here. And it recalibrated pretty well. Um, I'm going to finish off now actually with some words on predicting natural live birth. So I'm moving on from IVF. So this is going further back in time uh, to the point of diagnosis of unexplained uh, infertility. Um, so you may have seen this website before. Uh, this is the Freya model, which was developed in the Netherlands by uh, Claudia Huno in 2004. Um, and it's, it's actually used in the Netherlands to make decisions for treatment. Um, so basically what this is, it's just a an online tool. So the, the, the prediction model was converted into an online calculator and it just asks you for the female age. So in this example, we've put 20 here, um, how long the couple were trying, one year, no previous pregnancy, they were referred by a GP, 10% percent, percentage progressive motile sperm um, and no diagnosis of uh, tubal block. Um, and then it just gives you a probability. So the probability of natural ongoing pregnancy within one year is 37% in this example. Um, so I'm just gonna to touch on some of the dangers of misapplying models. So that HUNO model, this frame model is only developed to be used at the point of diagnosis of unexplained infertility, but some people in other clinical areas and I'm sure infertility as well, uh, apply these models maybe a few months later down the line or six months later down the line to the same patients. 
Um, so I'm just going to illustrate what is wrong with doing that uh, using these, this, this uh, little plot here. So this plot just shows you um, like a distribution of uh, the chances of having a baby um, in these couples of unexplained. And that's just in, in the first month after diagnosis. So if you imagine during that first month, um, some of the more uh, fertile patients will get pregnant. So that's these little ones with the heart or little babies in, the, in their tummies. Um, and then in the next month, because these guys have got pregnant, you're left with a more kind of infertile distribution of patients. Um, and then during that next month, some more people will get pregnant, some more couples will get pregnant. And you're left in more kind of infertile group of patients. So if you apply a model that was actually developed for use in these patients to this group of patients, you're going to end up with two optimistic predictions. It, it'll end up um, giving uh, calculating too high predicted probabilities. So these models, you should, you should always be aware of when these models should be used. Um, so how do we then make predictions in these patients um, after uh, diagnosis? Well, uh, in the Netherlands, again, um, Rick van Eklen, as part of his PhD, he developed a, a nice prediction model that can predict natural conception in, in couples of, in, of not, with um, mild or unexplained infertility. And uh, this model predicts at the point of diagnosis or workup, diagnostic workup completion, and this, you can see here that the average probability was 27%. And then it predicts again, it can be applied again six months later. And you can see that the average prediction reduces to 20%. And then at one year, one and a half, and so forth. Um, so you can kind of see how these patients' prognosis changes uh, over time. And that can be used to help make decisions. So for example, if a, if a clinician told a patient to at this time point to keep trying to conceive naturally um, for one year they could come back and the model would be applied at one year uh, and give a more accurate uh, estimate of their predicted probability and then a decision could be made at that point on, on treatment. Uh, I'm just going to finish then um, on a paper that uh, we did in Aberdeen um, published uh, 2019. Um, so it's taking forward that previous model. Uh, so that model only tells us what the predictions are for uh, natural conceptions um, at different points over time. But how do we know though that um, IVF will be much higher or much or you know, how do we know how much better or worse IVF treatment will be uh, in these patients without knowing what their prediction would be with treatment as well as without treatment? So we developed a, another uh, dynamic prediction model um, that can predict uh, the chances of having a baby with and without treatment um, at different points in time. And I think I'm not going to talk any more about this because I know Batty is going to speak about this uh, in his talk. So I'm just going to finish quickly with a few points. So prediction models can be very useful tools to help inform patients and make treatment decisions if developed properly. Um, as I've gone through uh, today. Um, for prediction of outcomes following IVF, we have good quality models already. So let's externally validate them rather than developing more. So rather than developing a, a new model on say 200 patients, why not use your data um, to validate one of the existing models um, for use in your clinic or your country? Um, and then um, as I just covered at the end there. Dynamic prediction is currently the, the kind of area of interest in this field of prediction modeling. Um, and it can be very useful to see how patient predictions evolve um, over time. So that's, uh, that's the end of my talk. Sorry, I think I've overran by a little bit. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, David. That was an excellent lecture. So, uh, I am uh, Thank you. tossing the microphone over to my friend here, Barishata, and he will be directing the uh, discussion and the question and answer session, okay? 
Arish. Okay. So, hi everyone. Thanks, David, for joining. And the actually the, the, the talk, which was you know very well adjusted for the non-statistician audience. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. For that. Um, I'd like to ask uh, our colleagues who are listening to, I mean, if they have any questions at this point or, or the, you know, if not, then maybe we can discuss everything after after listening to Professor Bhattacharya's lecture as well. Um, şu noktada bir şey sormak isteyen var mı? Ben sorabilir miyim? Tabii ki. O nasıl soru abi öyle? Hello. <gülüyor> Buyurun, please. Yok, parmak. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent speech. Actually, I have a very short question. Uh, what do you think about the prediction, the effect of the prediction models on uh, dropout rates? For example, for in IUF, actually, for example, in the beginning of the cycle, when the prediction model give 30% a chance of the pregnancy, and if it changed to 10% after the before the embryo transfer, does it increase the, the dropout rates of the patients? Drop out rate. So David, David. Um, so Dr. Marjan, Professor Marjan is. You know, we're working at the same clinic. So the, his 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 point is, um, would you think? I mean, that's not a exactly statistical question, but um, would you think when if you provide the patient with a you know like a a changing probability of live birth to a during the course of the treatment. So let's say we've counseled them as, you know, listen, your chance of live birth with this cycle is 30%, okay? And then she had a collection, the the laboratory procedures, and just on the day of, you know, transfer, you know, we, we, we end up saying, oh, well, uh, your chances is like 10%, you know, at this point. So would you, I mean, that's exactly this question is, I mean, would you think that would affect her continuing with treatment? But probably that would depend on the the, 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 the payment scheme, etc. right? Yeah, so are you basically asking whether the, predicted, the, the prediction from the model may actually affect her decision to continue treatment? Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes exactly. In a, in a sense, yes. In a sense, yes. Eventually, I mean, uh, I mean, that's one of the aims of these models is to give patients their, their kind of realistic chances of, of having a baby um, at whatever cycle the models developed to predict from. Um, and if it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it is, they are kind of developed to kind of shape uh, expectations of patients um, and to help them prepare emotionally and financially. But um, at the end of the day, they're only a model. So, I mean, a model that predicts a probability of live birth of say 20%. Um, I, I would say of, highly personal, right? I wouldn't like, yeah, I wouldn't like the model to be used to make a decision on whether they should stop being treated. <laughs> um, I think that's a discussion with the clinician. I mean, these models only really used to try and like, give them an idea of what their chances will be. They're not set in stone. There's always a margin of error around these, these uh, predictions. Okay, so we can discuss this further, you know, like after listening to the clinical side as well, Professor Bhattacharya's lecture. Okay, and so, all right, then, they thank you for the lecture, and yeah, we'll we'll be together again in the discussion. And okay. yes, Professor Bhattacharya, welcome. Thanks well, for thank joining. You. Thanks for accepting thank the invitation. And Thanks very much. Very much forward. Do you are you are you in charge of the screen, Barris, or are you expecting me to share my screen and no, put no, up my slide? Screen. Okay. Yes, yes, please. You can share your screen and you can whichever you prefer, by the way. Yes, we can see your slides. Excellent. Perfect. Well, look, thank you very, very much. Um, we, we're running a little bit behind, so I'll speed up. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. And in a sense, I can keep my talk really short because you're a really well-informed audience now that you've listened to David. So I might as well just go home or maybe stay and answer a few questions. But the outline that I've chosen to use today is to pr provide the concept or share the concept of infertility or subfertility as a prognosis. 
some of the examples of prediction models that are um, around. Draw that to a discussion about using these models to treat or not to treat something that was raised by a colleague earlier, but we're going to talk in a more generic sense, not about a specific patient, and then hopefully come up with some practical recommendations. But before I do all that, I'd like to take your, um, your attention and draw it to pretty old data. These are from 1975. And if I can draw your attention to some of these um, graphs, I can try and explain what they actually mean in the context of prediction models. So if you think about this, you've got percentage pregnant on the y-axis, time in months on the x-axis. And we're talking about couples who, in the spink line, represent a cohort who've just stopped birth control. So I've just started um, trying for a pregnancy. And in them, over a period of 12 months, we would expect 84% to get pregnant. If we talk about a different group of couples who've been trying for a year, we then have the blue line where the chances of pregnancy over the next 12 months is much less, but it's still a reasonable 49%. Finally, we come to the green line. This is a group of couples where no pregnancy has been achieved despite trying for three years. They have a much worse prognosis. And there you have it. I've used the word. Our diagnosis of what we call infertility is essentially one based on prognosis. And if we think about that, these are things we already know, but perhaps don't choose to acknowledge formally. Subfertility or infertility, as we use these words interchangeably, is not sterility, apart from a few exceptions. So therefore, my argument is that dichotomization of couples into fertile and infertile stroke sterile is a bit of an oversimplification. What we actually have is various shades of fertility potential, and we can estimate these based on chances of conception. And just to draw your attention back to the slide I showed earlier, using an 80-20 rule, if you have a population of couples in whom chances of pregnancy over the next 12 months is low, we group them under the label of infertility, although they're far from sterile. So therefore, subfertility management essentially needs to be prognosis based if you're going to bring it in line with subfertility diagnosis. And of course, there are problems with the current definition where if you use the ICMART glossary, then essentially unsuccessful attempts to conceive for a period of 12 months. In actual fact, if you have duration of exposure to pregnancy on the, the x-axis, so that's the number of months, you'll immediately see that putting age of the female partner on the y-axis gives us a more nuanced interpretation, which is someone who's young might have to wait a little bit longer before they have the same prognosis over the next 12 months as someone who's much older waiting for a shorter period of time. So for example, if you had a 40-year-old woman, you wouldn't probably want her to wait as long as that before you took action. Whereas if you had a 20-year-old woman, you might want to wait a little bit longer. So that brings me to the use of clinical models in our clinical arena. And I would like to argue that they actually go all the way back in terms of optimizing our diagnosis of infertility, because my thesis is that this 12-month rule for everybody is probably not fit for purpose because 12 months in a 20-year-old is not the same as 12 months in a 40-year-old when the definition is based on predicted chances of pregnancy over the next few months. And therefore, prediction models can be used to decide whom to treat, when to treat. So that's a fundamental um, discussion and a decision to be made, but also maybe to estimate success rates with alternative treatments and indeed treatments versus no treatment. And when we do this level of prediction, we can do it over a period of time and actually try and predict time to pregnancy as well. 
David's taken you through a number of prediction models, and I'm not expecting you by any stretch of the imagination to read all the small print here. It just shows that there are a number of factors that we consider to be prognostic and we've used in previous models. Some of the earliest models to be used in a general infertile population have been those developed by Claudine Huno, and David has referred to them. And these were two early publications, and they were brought together in a subsequent publication where two different models were synthesized to work out the chances of pregnancy in a population of patients with no obvious barrier to conception. So you can imagine that women with anovulation and couples with severe male infertility, severe tubal pathology are obviously excluded from this population. So the, the remaining couples are assumed to have what is essentially unexplained infertility. And as you, you've seen in the previous presentation, the HUNO model uses uh, these data to estimate the chances of a live birth resulting from a pregnancy within the following 12 months. And that's the rigidity of that model. It can only predict over that time horizon. And the predictors that the HUNO model sees as important are age. So the younger the woman, the higher the chance, shorter the duration of infertility, higher the chance. Previous pregnancy, a higher chance, higher to total motile sperm concentration, higher the chance for those who believe in postcoital tests, and they did in the Netherlands at that time, that had an effect. And something that was unique in their setting, whether a patient was seen in a primary care center or in a secondary and tertiary care center had an influence, as you can imagine, because couples are seen at a much earlier stage in their infertility journey in primary care by GPs. We've already familiarized ourselves with how we assess the validity of a model. So you've, you, you've been told about discrimination and calibration. What this slide does is shows you that the HUNO model has been externally validated in a Dutch population. And although the discrimination is quite poor, so the area under the curve means 0.59, which is, which is not particularly good, the calibration shows a reasonably good fit. And this is, of course, the FRIA website, which amongst all the countries in the entire planet, the Dutch seem to be the only ones who tend to use on a regular basis. Coming now to IVF, so this is a different population. One of the trailblazers in the field was my colleague uh, in Aberdeen, Alan Templeton, who wrote this paper in 1996 using data from the UK HFEA. And this technically is one of the earliest models to be developed in IVF. And what he found out through this exercise was that, was that age, duration of infertility, number of previous unsuccessful IVF, tubal infertility and previous pregnancies were influential in terms of predicting IVF success. And to be fair, these parameters remain true to this day. More models have come since then. So this is Scott Nelson, a colleague from Glasgow, his model. And again, as David pointed out, this predicts live birth over one fresh IVF cycle, but does it well, and again, has been used in an online calculator called IVF Predict. David has gone a step further and using the same data, which is VA UK data, developed a model that not only predicts outcomes over one fresh um, IVF cycle, but goes on to pre present cumulative predictions. So to give you two examples, if you look at the top, um, coupled with a duration of infertility of two years, is the, their outcomes are presented in blue, Longer duration of infertility, five years, outcomes are presented in a graph in red. You've got number of complete IVF cycles in the x-axis, and you have cumulative probability of live birth. So this was the first time that the cumulative outcomes were calculated over a number of what we call complete IVF cycles, each comprising a fresh embryo transfer 
followed by as many frozen embryo transfers resulted from that oocyte retrieval. And if you look at a scenario here where there is a male factor and ICSI is the treatment, you find how influential age is because irrespective of the duration of infertility, if, if the woman is age 30, the overarching chances of success, cumulative success over a number of IVF cycles is much higher than if the female age is 40. And in a different setting, unexplained infertility with IVF, again, that difference is sustained. So the blue line and the dotted red line here refer to younger women, regardless of whether they've been trying for two years and five years, showing that IVF is a bit of a leveler in terms of duration of infertility, but cannot overcome the disparity caused by age. And this is available if you're interested in trying at this web page hosted within the University of Aberdeen. So if you do a search for IVF, prediction IVF calculator, it's called OPIS, and you put in Aberdeen, this will come up. And you can actually use it in the clinic with your patients to give them an idea of their chances of success. <coughs> Um, David's referred to this paper, which, um, which is a systematic review of IVF prediction models. And the points I'd like to make are there's a plethora of models. But my question to you is, as a community, do you actually use them? If not, why not? There are reasons. Most models only predict outcome per fresh IVF cycle, whereas we use frozen quite a lot now. Very few predicted cumulative outcome, whereas that's what couples want to know. They want to know how many treatments to budget for, for example. In terms of quality, Tripod refers to a quality assessment tool. And as you can see, the higher the score, the better. And the scores are very variable in those that are out there. The C statistics, so this is discrimination, quite variable, but not particularly impressive. But calibration is better. And of course, we are biased, but based on this tool that we use to assess quality, and I hate to say this in front of David, because he'll get big headed, his model did come out as the best model out there to be used. However, if we look at the full extent of our patients, the total numbers that we treat, and these are data from the Netherlands, if you look at months from diagnosis, the black line refers to the number of patients who get pregnant in a couple who have a chance of spontaneous pregnancy, so unexplained infertility. So quite a high proportion get pregnant. But within that high proportion, the blue line refers to spontaneous pregnancy. So if you allow couples with no obvious cause a bit of time, a large proportion of them do reserve the right to get pregnant and frequently do so. And if you look at the role of IVF, you can actually see this red line here, it's relatively modest. So one of the things that's really important for us to consider as a professional group is the added value of IVF, because if you look at it dispassionately, just crude, quoting crude IVF success rate is not enough because even if we say that our patients in a clinic have a 50 to 60% chance of IVF live birth after a complete IVF cycle, so let's say fresh frozen, most of us would be very impressed. But what we really want to know is over that period of time, what would happen if we didn't treat those patients and the difference that IVF would make. So at the moment, if we want to answer this question, we've got the HUNO model to find out what would happen to couples without treatment over one year. And we've got David's IVF model that can tell us what would happen to them if we gave them one or more complete IVF treatments. This is where I need to do a little bit of a detour and impress upon you where medicine as a whole is going, which is into stratified medicine or personalized medicine. And the approach there is to target the treatments according to the attributes shared by different subgroups of patients. And the question isn't whether treatment A is better than treatment B in the entire population, but in the patient in front of us, will treatment A give a better chance of achieving a live birth than treatment B? 
And when we looked at it initially, so this is almost a conceptual model, we could have two separate models where we, cal we calculate the chances of spontaneous uh, pregnancy leading to live birth in, remember, patients who can conceive on their own versus the chances of conceiving through IVF. And we take away one minus the other, and then you have a very crude assessment of treatment benefit. A more sophisticated way, to, way of doing that would be to see what happens if you give IVF to these couples. Remember, there's unexplained infertility and see what happens if you don't treat them, but to make it more complex by bringing in prognostic factors. So that's that. And the stratified medicine approach, which is more nuanced, more sophisticated, is to compare IVF outcomes, the expectant management outcomes. And this time we bring in not just prognostic factors like age and duration, et cetera, but also factors which affect the success rate of IVF in a population, other things remaining the same, such as, and we know this, hydrosalpinges can affect the outcome of IVF treatment. So that's the stratified medicine approach that we think we should consider. And to make things a little bit more complicated, but a little bit more like life, life we need to bring in the concept of dynamic prediction, which is if you're actually sitting with a couple in front of you, telling them what's going to happen over a year is pretty much pointless because they want to know what happens on a month by month basis. And this is particularly important if you're making discuss the discussions around key decisions, like when should no treatment or expectant management end and when should active treatment begin. So this needs a constant reassessment of changes in prognosis, i.e. constant recalibration of prediction. So again, conceptually, this is what happens. You've got months, you've got the probability of pregnancy, and we need to be able to calculate a monthly prediction and make that as accurate as we can. Calculating the outcome at this point as to what will happen 12 months later is just not good enough for clinical decision-making. So that brings me to the paper David mentioned, which is David's last paper. And this brings in all these different concepts of dynamic prediction, of prediction of chances of pregnancy without treatment and with treatment. And this is what you get. And I just have to emphasize the fact that this is very much an alpha or a very initial version done on a relatively small data set. And the reason why it's a relatively small data set is it is a population-based data set, but it's from the Northeast of Scotland. And the reason why it's difficult to find these data is it's very rare anywhere in the world to have complete population capture of data on patients presenting with infertility, all the treatment that they have, all the way to live birth and, and live birth outcomes. Because of course, in other parts of the world, people go to different clinics. The downside of that is that we have a small population, but the upside is we also know who conceived without treatment. So if you look at the first scenario, which is couple A, where the female partner's 30 years and there's relatively small duration of infertility, no previous treatment. The blue refers to expectant management, i.e. no treatment. These are the confidence intervals, the shaded area. The green line refers to outcomes after superovulation, IUI. The red line after IVF. And again, you can see the confidence intervals there. So what's really telling about this is if you look at somebody who's aged 30, even at 0 0.0, you can see that there's a reasonably healthy 30% chance of conception. And that goes up with IVF. But the argument that we often use is 30% is reasonably good. So we encourage people to wait. But over a period of time, the chances go down with no treatment and the chances go up with other treatment. With a 40-year-old, all the chances are much lower. So there's very little benefit in waiting here instead of going straight for treatment. And again, this is available online as a prediction tool if you do a search for it. So in conclusion, a 12-month definition of infertility, which is the standard definition we use, 
is based on prognosis, but pretty much is a trigger for initiating investigations, not necessarily to rush into active treatment. Although, of course, the population that we deal with have an expectation of pregnancy on demand, and therefore a diagnosis of infertility in them engenders a view that they have sterility and pushes them towards early use of IVF treatment. That's why planning when and how to treat is absolutely critical. And in order to use a personalized prognosis driven approach, prediction models are necessary and they're here to stay. And to push that concept a little bit further, I would like to make the point that this in a sense plays into the expectations of our patients in a positive way by allowing them to have real expectations in terms of what would happen if they tried for a period on their own before going on to active treatment. And I would call that whole continuum active family planning. So this is planning for a family you wish to have rather than the family you don't. But at the same time, it protects people against overtreatment. Thank you very much. I'll stop there with some lovely pictures of Aberdeen, both in summer as well as winter. Thank you. So thank you for the lecture. That was really informative regarding how to use and how to look at these um, you know, prediction models and calculators. Um, I'll let the audience, I, le I let the, uh, the colleagues to ask a few questions. If they have, then you know, I have a few of my mind. And I see that Aishan, who is one of our colleagues at the American Hospital, has a question. So Aishan, would you like to direct the question yourself, please? Sorry, we can't hear you. Yes. Sorry. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Bhattacharya. I want to ask that if your model is uh, sensitive to new diagnosis in IVF treatment, for example, adenomyosis, or the lower incidence disease, for example, hypogonadotropic hypogonadotropy, I like this. And, um, and my other question is, do you use this uh, data for the uh, recommendation for the uh, upcoming sickness of any patient by using artificial intelligence? Thank you. So there are two, two separate questions. Yeah, I'll answer the first one first. So you, you, you're asking about the applicability of this model in other areas of infertility in couples with different diagnoses like hypo-hypo, is that right? Yes, and yes. newly diagnosed uh, disease, for example, adenomyosis. Yeah, the, the straight answer is there's no reason why it, it, it couldn't be. I mean, hypo-hypo is a very extreme situation where we know that biologically it's implausible that these women will get pregnant on their own. So to have a prediction model, have a fighting chance of predicting, you need to have the possibility that they may or may not get pregnant in reasonable numbers in both groups. But adenomyosis is an interesting area. Um, it is something certainly that we could look at. At the moment, the limiting factor is lack of population-based data on this. And as you can imagine from someone in the specialty, you'll understand that adenomyosis has a huge ascertainment bias because with the right equipment, with the right skills, people can diagnose it, whereas otherwise you can't. And therefore, a population-based diagnosis of adenomyosis is a little bit of a struggle still. In terms of artificial intelligence, and maybe we can bring David into the, the conversation here, we can use conventional methods such as, you know, logistic regression, which is what Dave, David's discussed, or we, and, and also a more I would say clinical approach where you decide which predictors you're going to use and you feed those into the model based on biological plausibility, or you could have a more nihilistic view where you throw every predictor at it and you let artificial intelligence sort it out. I think it's, it, it is a way. I would also caution that at some point you need that clinical sense check 
because otherwise it would be a perfect model predicting something that's flawed in a perfect way. Sorry, David, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, first of all, I have to say I'm not, uh, I've never used machine learning uh, methods, but um, from what I've read about the area, I think it's early days yet still for that area, that field. Um, I think um, there has been some controversial papers on different clinical areas where um, these, some of the reporting of the performance of these machine learning methods, they look like discrimination is very high, but they actually don't assess calibration. And then when that's investigated, the, the predictions actually are not uh, accurate compared to what was observed in the data set. And uh, as Bobby alluded to, they're very data hungry. They need lots of data, these methods. Uh, and it's quite easy to just fit hundreds of predictors into these models and without thinking about it. And they overfit and give biased over, over predictions. I think a nice merger between what I've presented today and the area of machine learning would be good. A bit more of a thoughtful process for machine learning would be great. I'm not dissing the methods at all. I think some of the models they use are very uh, interesting, applicable, but I think um, there seems to be more, there needs to be a bit more of a, a thoughtful process of how they, uh, of what they put into the models and how they assess performance. Thank you. All right. Um, any other questions? Arkan has what, two questions? Okay. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Also, can I just add as well that another caveat? <laughs> Um, there was a paper recently, actually, uh, a systematic review in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology that showed that um, there was no performance benefit for machine learning versus logistic regression in a systematic review of different models. Um, so I think um, they also showed that the, the, the machine learning do need a lot more kind of uh, you know, thoughtful processes, but I think it just shows that just aggression is quite seems quite basic these days, but it actually is still up to the task of, of, of predicting. Um, so uh, that's another good paper uh, by uh, Chris Todulo, uh in 2019 in, in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. Okay. Thank you, David. So uh, Arkan has one question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the both presenters for the uh, very, very nice explanation of this extremely complicated topic. I would like to ask one question to uh, David McLaren and one question to Professor Bhattacharya. Uh, the first uh, I'd like to ask David, it's about the model selection process of the, uh, the prediction model you published in the BMJ. You said you used a manual backwards selection process, which is sensible uh, since you want to you know, add parameters with biological plausibility. But I have seen a general lack of interaction terms. And actually, it's a, quite a complicated task, given how many um, variables interact with each other, with multicollinearity, et cetera. Apart from the traditional statistical approaches like use, using a CAIC information criteria or looking at the discrimination and prediction, what uh, other kind of tips and tricks you use for model selection and specification? And my second question is to Professor Bachataria. Uh, apart from building the model and validating it externally, the final step of uh, showing this is an actual you know, clinically useful tool is would be uh, you know, conduct an RCT to see the utility of the prediction model in the clinical uh, practice. How would you design an RCT to actually compare uh, the regular, um, regular counseling that we provide to the patients and the additional utility of the, these prediction models? Should I go first? <laughs> before I forget the question. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So the BMJ paper, it was a mixture of uh, manual backwards and also um, before the backward process, we, I actually, we, we made sure we put in uh, a few fixed predictors that uh, were not susceptible to being removed. So uh, female age, for example, and duration of fertility and previous pregnancy were three predictors that we kept in there no matter what. And that was just based on a systematic review that was published by uh, Laura van Loendersloot in the Netherlands uh, a few years ago. 
those three were seen as uh, known ex uh, clinical predictors. And then for the rest of the predictors, we, we used this manual backward selection. Um, selection processes seem to, to get slated a little bit in the literature, but if you've got a massive data set like we had, uh, they're absolutely totally fine because um, you know, you're very unlikely to get something that's uh, not significant um, if, it, if it's important because um, you've got enough power and data there to detect it. Um, the issue is if you've got a small data set with very few, so maybe if you've got like say four or 500 patients, but maybe 30 or 40 predictors, that's where the, data, the model building kind of decisions are very difficult. Um, to help with that, actually, there's a recent paper published in Stats and Medicine in the, over the last year or two by Richard Riley from the University of Kiel. And he goes into actually very study specific sample size calculations for building prediction models. Um, if you've got no choice on the sample size, if you've got your own registry and you've only got 500 or 600 patients, um, I would advise that you um, be sensible of your kind of hungriness <laughs> for your data, as I mentioned earlier in my talk. Um, so if you're limited of sample size, I would just make sure, make, make a more pragmatic decision and just put in um, you know, the more kind of a smaller number of very important predictors if you're developing your own model. Um, also, you could also do things like validate an existing model with your data. Um, there are recent sample size calculation papers for validation as well, but you, you need slightly, you can get away with slightly less data for validating existing models and for developing them. Um, and then, uh, so you can fit, fit uh, your data Fit, fit, sorry, an existing model equation to your new data uh, and do all these performance metrics on it to see how well it performs. Um, and there are all sorts of other fancy methods for dealing with low sample sizes. Like, I don't know if you've heard of methods like lasso, um, penalize maximum likelihood, which all shrink covariance matrices down. Um, but lots of papers have come out recently saying even these methods are not great. So you just need data, more data. <laughs> data and a thoughtful uh, model building process are the two things. Thank you for the answer. Actually, that's right. one of the main reasons why I asked because uh, despite having a very large data, you know, with obviously many uh, collinear variates, uh, I, yeah. do you think, uh, as you said, you know, lasso or other selection processes may have been better because there's a general lack of interaction trends in your model. And when I use the uh, online calculator, you can actually select, for example, unexplained fertility and tubal problems as, you know, together, which are just mutually exclusive outcomes. And the prediction model gives different uh, risk estimates for each scenario, which shouldn't be really possible because, you know, uh, they are mutually exclusive outcomes. So do you think, is there a better way of specifying the model in such conditions? So interactions um, for prediction models. Um, um, if, you're, if you're going to go down the interaction, please for a second. So then we will reach the rest of the audience. How to be on the model? Sorry, I'm actually struggling to hear what you're saying, Boris. Sorry, you can't hear me. No. Um, it's very, it's kind of a disturbed kind um, of uh, sign I can't hear you clearly. Um, you know, that's, that's really a very detailed discussion uh, for regarding multi construction. And the, the vast majority of the colleagues today are, you know, mostly clinicians with, you know, not that in that knowledge with the model construction. So if you guys don't mind, can we skip to uh, the second question to Fatih? Well, Fatih, mean, there's something, there's something you really want to say. Yes, what, you, what, you're being told, what you're being told is this, this, this is a very technical conversation and you're losing your audience, or quite a lot of it. So take it offline. <laughs> <laughs> Coming, if I could answer the second question, I see you've only got three minutes left very quickly. Um, in terms of an approach 
to a prognostic model, yes, you could certainly go down the, the route of how you do it for diagnostic tests, which is to do a randomized trial and see if outcomes are better with or without the use of that particular diagnostic test, or in this case, a prediction model. The catch, and there is a big catch is, of course, that uh, prediction models and the, the evidence you get from randomized trials fulfill two separate set of um, purposes. So a randomized trial gives you an idea of what is better for a population, whereas a prediction model helps you to individualize treatment. So it takes you beyond the point at which a randomized trial can influence the decision to treat or not a particular patient. And we're still not there because even the prediction model will give you a percentage. Whereas for a patient, the answer that they're looking for is either zero or one, yes or no. It's never 30% or 40% or 90%. But to answer your question, you could do a randomized trial. The problem is in deciding what your outcome will be, because as a consequence of using a prediction model, some people may not go through treatment. So actually, having live birth as an endpoint may not necessarily be the, the, the necessarily responsible, desired, and appropriate outcome. And you might need to go beyond that into something like a satisfaction or confidence in decision-making as outcomes. There is a paradox in infertility, which I think we are all aware of, but we don't talk about it. It's, it's, it's that IVF is most successful in the fertile. So regardless of your prediction model, if you treat the people in whom you're expected to get the highest chances of success, and you include those in whom you could possibly have waited a little bit longer, then you're going to maximize live birth rates. But that's not the point. The point is to optimize treatment, not to maximize treatment. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice answer. And I, I, I read David's, David's response. response on the chat as well. Yeah, he says you know, he, he has included some traction um, terms. I, but I mean, they, 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 they really, you know, um, they they improve the predictive performance a little, okay. Um, and if you guys have another three five minutes, actually, I want to share two things with you. One is you know really you know thank you for this you know, insightful presentations. And so I think what I show supports David a bit, and also may you know kind of answer Aishan's question too. Um, when I read these papers, so you're seeing my screen, right? Um, so I wanted to see, you know, how two different, two, two, two different available online tools, you know, one is yours and the other one is the American, the, 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 the SAT database based, the prediction tool. Aha, uh -huh, Boris, you don't know this, but actually that's our tool as well. Oh, yeah. You did that too? Oh, great. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. And, you know, why I think it may answer, you know, like, you know, in a way to Aishan's question about, you know, endometriosis and meiosis. I mean, not obviously in terms of, you know, predicting an individuals with a certain con certain condition like the meiosis um, chances. But in general, the two models have, you know, a different number of predictors. You know, one includes BMI, one includes prior full-term pregnancy. And one actually includes, you know, more categories for diagnosis. The one that, the, 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 that so obviously you used with this SRT data, and which allows you to take multiple diagnoses. And you know, well, what I get the, uh, the impression I got is, you know, other than age, the duration of infertility, and the indication in general. So probably, yeah, the predictive performance is more or less the same because you almost come up with the same numbers. You see for one cycle and with three cycles, the difference is really like, you know, two to 3% each for each scenario. The only major difference I've noticed is with the, the other database, the CDC database, uh, decreased ovarian reserve. You can, you can choose that as a diagnosis as well. And that, that then, you know, then the, 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 the predictions start um, diverge, diverting. I mean, if you, you factor in decreased ovarian reserve, so probably that's not possible with the, 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 the UK data set. So it's only an ovulatory. But yeah, I see your point, David. So introducing, you know, a lot of other um, 
variables probably won't improve much. So that's probably, you know, how, you know, as good as we get, right? Should we comment it? Should we, should we interpret it that way? Yeah, that's a very nice uh, table. I haven't done, done that myself, so that's nice. Um, yeah, I, I think, as I said, um, if the, the, the over, just, as long as you put in the overwhelming important predictors, like female age trumps everything by miles. If you've got that in, you've got probably 80% of your kind of predictive performance uh, settled. And then everything else after that, duration, previous pregnancy, and some diagnosis, if you... The further you go back down after that, you're you're just improving predictions very very minimally. That comes back to my interactions comment that the interactions add very very little to. Uh, they may come up come up significant if you've got a big data set, but actually if you compare the predictions with and without an interaction included, they will. Be, I, I would be very surprised if there's a much difference in, in the prediction. But there is, there is a very good reason for that, because if you go back to basic epidemiological principles, if you follow a causal pathway, so age will drive age, will drive the number of eggs, will drive the number of embryos, etc. You know, so sometimes this is the problem I have with machine learning, because you're putting all this in without thinking. It's all indiscriminate use of variables. Actually, there are very, very few factors which are strong drivers of success. And I think we know what, where they are, and we can be parsimonious in our use of them. Yeah. And, you know, absolutely, um, we should, one, one point that I want to make clinically is, you know, I think the most important point when we are with a couple, counseling them prior to treatment, is to make sure they understand these numbers, okay? So what I always tell a patient, let's, let's say someone who is like 42, you know, very low ovarian reserve, several failed cycles, this and your chances of live birth with the next treatment cycle probably is what at the range of like three, four percent. And then I, I feel the need to, you know, make the explanation, listen, I mean, this is not like, if you are consistent enough, if you're persistent enough, if you follow everything, you know, precisely, then you'll make it. It's not something like that. It's totally out of your control. You know, it's, it's just a probability. So I think, you know, that's for, for daily practice, one important thing is to make sure that they make sense of these numbers. Okay, right, guys, listen, I mean, thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you for the insightful lectures. And apologies for connecting. And so we won't keep you any longer. I know you, you guys are very busy. Okay? No, no, thanks very much. Uh, good to meet you all. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, guys. All the best. Bye. Thank you.